They're so cute when they swim. There we go. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so Tito, actually, I w I've been wondering, so you were on, you know, you always introduce as, you know, you got your start uh, at sea on the expedition when they found Titanic. Um, so, like, presumably you weren't in the control van. I remember it. I know it was, like, really early in the morning. Um, like, so where were you and, and what was, like, how did you hear about it and what was, like, the mood in that particular moment? So I do believe it happened uh, 2 or 3 a.m., and there were some rumors about the cook going to wake up uh, Dr. Ballard, who's, uh, I remember the cook being John Bartolome, the two of us had flown over the Azores together to get on the ship for that cruise. Um, I woke up for breakfast, and of course the ship was just a buzz yeah. uh, with that. But there, I mean, the first thing they did as soon as they, or at least I think so, of course, you know, being the messman, I'm so <laughs> removed from what's really right. going on yeah, in that's the what science world and all that, and it being my first cruise. You know, maybe it had been my 30th or the 40th, I'd been a little more aware of things. But what I remember the most was, uh, the, you know, the instant they found the debris field was they dragged the, the sleds back up onto the ship, which were Argo and I, I don't forget, I want to say they were using the video camera at that time, which would have been Angus. They pulled that back up, dropped the transponder net, and the, you know, the anticipation while they did that, it takes a while to put uh, transponders down in 4,000 meters of water and survey them in so that yeah. you would have good navigation. And, and you know, that was kind of my first, you know, eye-opening experience of, you know, you have to, if you don't have good nav, you don't know where you are and what good is it. So yeah. pop that up, and I think it was another day or two before we actually went down and started surveying and finding the the two parts of the hull and such, but like, it, the excitement on board. Was yeah, it must, it must have been a just amazing you like know, buzz on yeah. the ship. Yeah, I think some expensive booze was broken out. <laughs> the ships were still wet back in those days, but uh, yeah. it was just a crazy time, and I was, fill, you know, as the new messman and, you know, knowing the mission at, you know, some point, was just making jokes about it because I didn't, never for a moment thought that, you know, we would be successful. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so, for viewers who, who don't know, they 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 came across, and it was with a camera tow sled. They do, they were not using sonar. Um, so basically, like at, like Atalanta, um, they came across the boiler, which is a very distinguishable and, and recognizable feature, because um, uh, Dr. Ballard was targeting the debris field rather than the wreck, because that's going to be a lot bigger than uh, in terms of area than than the wreck. Uh, and then once he found the boiler they were able to follow the debris trail over to the uh to where the wrecks were or the two p parts of the wreck were and as tito said yeah you need you need to put down the transponders to know um where Back they, then, where they were on the seabed there's long baseline navigation yeah and what is a transponder it's a navigational beacon long baselines based on setting some uh, beacons uh, in a in an array so that you can triangulate and get a good position for the, well, I wouldn't, uh, back then I think they were using the phrase ROV, mm -hmm. uh, but you triangulate from there, you survey cops? those in so you have a very, very solid position. the top position right of the screen. And go from there. What's that, Sebastian? Is that a uh, cops towards the top right of the screen? Uh, oh, here? Yeah. Wow, you were really paying attention. Is it? It looks like yep. it, yeah. Oh. Looks like facing away from us. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Ooh, good wow. eye. My my vision has been restored after my incident. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if any all of you heard about my incident. No. The no. sunscreen. Um, but I actually put rust water in my eyes. Oh yeah. <laughs> How'd you do that? Um, I got, as Hannah mentioned, I got um, sunscreen in my eyes. And I went to go wash it out, and the water came out clear for a few, few seconds. I went to go oh. start putting it in, it changed midway. Oh. And my vision was a little bit blurry during last watch. Oh. Well, it's definitely been restored. Good eyes, seeing this. <laughs> Probably going to go put an asterisk next to all of your IDs from the last watch. <laughs> Double so check cute. those. Now oh. I also think of Kara's drawing. Oh. I know. <gasps> 
called? Kupayanaha. 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 That's cool. Amazing on our last They have watch. just like the little laziest swim. It's so cute. Dun, 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 dun. It looks like they're sashing. <laughs> oh, there's a shadow of something. It's a fashion walk. Yeah. You see that shadow? I saw the shadow. Yeah. Oh, well, well, it was oh. coral. Good. Afraid for our little buddy here. I'm spot. always amazed by just how tiny they are. They're really small. <laughs> okay, he, bye, Chanakops. He thinks he's gone far enough to escape. Bye, Triceratops. <laughs> Triceratops. <laughs> Triceratops. You mean Tina Cops. <laughs> Tina Cops. Uh, huh. oh, that was amazing. And speaking of Kupai Naha, um, there's a photo album that I was working on that got published, and it's titled Kupai Naha, Amazing Seamount Views from the Path of the Deep Sea Traveler. And it's got some images. It's really a collection of images that highlight a lot of moments that were amazing, or Kupai Naha, that um, some of them we shared together in the control van, um, but some of them are just like, amazing views that we've spotted on some of our other dyes. So if you are on the nautiluslive.org website and you scroll down to the bottom, you can check out recent highlights, including a video of a hitchhiking squat lobster, <laughs> which maybe we saw that. Yeah. I feel like I do remember a yeah. squat lobster hanging out with us for a little bit. Um, there's another photo album of birds that have been hanging out with us throughout oh, cool. the expedition yeah. that Upashina and Kara worked on. And then uh, Hannah, you did mention that uh, yesterday on the Nautilus Instagram and Facebook, I believe, uh, Kara took over the stories and yes. was doing some, like, uh, drawing lessons, some doodles. Oh, I, so I watched cute. those last night. Yeah. I also published a blog the other day. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, you want to tell us about it, Sebastian? Oh, that's right. You teased it the other day. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just a blog of talking about meet some explorer Sebastian. It should be under the gallery on the website. I think it got pushed off the main page already. Um, and it pretty much is this me talking about my journey from my youth to now about cool. my journey as a scientist, as an um, interdisciplinary and intersectional individual. Nice. And I gotta say, it was so beautifully written. Thank I you. I was well, so I'm impressed really with Sebastian's writing talents. Yeah, it's titled Meet Ocean Explorer Sebastian Martinez. So you can, yes, go to the nautiluslive.org site and then search or either go under gallery and it will pop up. And I got a message yesterday from a uh, former shipmate colleague uh, from several vessels who is works for Kongsberg, who makes our mapping hardware and software. They're in Edinburgh for a conference and they woke up watching BBC Breakfast and there was a story about the Dumbo octopus that Nautilus oh. had, one of the four that we had imaged and that was a fun way for to start the day knowing that we're all out here doing this work. And I think one of the um, really um, outstanding kind of um, collective experiences we have on board is really the, the diversity, mm -hmm. you know, with, with um, Sebastian, um, intersectionality, we have different languages being spoken on board, like the, the, the way that biodiversity is reflected on board the ship kind of mirrors the biodiversity that we have in the ocean. Yeah. And that beautiful biodiversity creates a very thriving kind of community and helps you know i think people who are out there who are thinking like is this a field for me like many of those on board are really role models for others who maybe have been marginalized and haven't been you know fully accepted and so i just feel so strongly that you know this expedition has really shown that diversity and the, the, um, the ways that we all can work together, even though we come from different perspectives and, and, and different places and different schools of thought and knowledge systems, but somehow it all works on here because of that mm -hmm. respect that we show for each other and um, kind of the space that we've all created together. 
Yeah, I appreciate you mentioning that, Malia, and bringing that up. Um, and Hannah, I know you brought up uh, during our introductions just how um, amazing that aspect has been of this experience. Like, mm -hmm. I was telling a lot of my students before I left that one of the things that I was most looking forward to was just, like, meeting everyone and getting to know everyone. And um, I don't think I realized just how diverse it was going to be until we got here. And I sat down and started talking to people about just lived experiences, like you said, just where everybody is from, like completely eye-opening experience, just learning about so many different people from different places, how they live their lives. And it's so powerful to be all in the same space and be so passionate about what we're doing. And I encourage my students to find places or opportunities where they have a chance to kind of find uh, their people or like find people that have um, a similar interest or something that they're passionate about and I feel like I can't even fully describe how powerful it is to like be all together um, doing this work. Okay. Argus. Dang it. Oh, did I miss something? There was something in the Argus camera. I don't know what it was. It looked like one of those things that we saw that was holding a dead head of a fish. So a siphonophore. 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 Yes. Did you guys see like. the uh, fish on the surface as you were coming into the van? No. Is that no. like no. mahi maybe? Oh, okay. Maybe that's and mahi's lots following lots us of them. earlier in the expedition. But I assume they all fled when the um, sharks started following us instead. Um, we have some viewers asking about the fish that we saw earlier. That was a chonacops. And that is spelled C H A U N O Cops. C O P S. Did I spell it wrong? I like Googled it just to make sure that I did not misspell it. No, you're right. I thought it was Chana, but it's Chano. Yes, Chano Cops. And if you Google them, also a common name is Sea Toad. That's easier to spell. Yes, so you can search sea toad and then see this beautiful red creature. Which is even smaller than you think it is yeah. on Google. It's like we, when we put our uh, our 10 centimeter lasers on her, it's like fits within them, which is oh. adorable. I'm so grateful. I don't. Even, I should have been keeping track. I don't know how many I have seen. On I think my we've watches. seen like six or so. Yeah, because there were like three total. on one do, on one watch, and I think we've seen them like three or four other times. On our watch? Or just yeah, on our watch. Yeah. yeah, we've seen them quite a few times. I'd say six or seven times on our watch. We should have kept a tally up here on the yeah. board. I, know. I think we yeah, saw a bat sight. fish first, we and did. then we started knocking out the China cops. Which, the bat fish was awesome because I did not know that they even existed. I don't remember seeing a bat fish. It was, it was the flat a, one. It looked very similar to China cops. cops, but it was more flat and almost like a triangle. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. It and was it wasn't pink. pink. It was pink? It was yes. pink. Oh, then maybe I'm uh, They're a close them relative of Chana Cops. There was a highlight video from our watch of us. I, I don't it. go and watch videos on Nautilus Live because of bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Not supposed to do that. <laughs> so, uh, just a nav update. It seems like the yes, ship has uh, been able to do the moves yeah. laterally pretty well. So, um, I think we can hit waypoint seven. Um, my thought for getting to waypoint eight was to try to minimize the steep downhill. We could actually kind of move uh, to the south along this, yep. this less steep ridge, um, and then go down to this little dip, and then back take, up to the take final a left. Waypoint. Yeah, uh, yeah, that works for me. Yeah, going to, through that downhill doesn't really make sense. Just like you would if you were hiking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Derek the, never does that. Only in Arizona. That was a good part of his early career was field work. Yeah, I know. And there's I'm just, plenty of good places in New Hampshire, too. That's true, yeah. I saw that uh, the University of New Hampshire has announced a $20 million investment in their Center for Coastal and ocean mapping and Great Lakes mapping. Oh, that's uh, great. Getting a new facility there. Wow. Yeah, so this is actually a big new uh, NOAA 
award mm -hmm. to in partnership with Un University of New Hampshire. Um, so it's, it's going to be really exciting. They're going to build a new um, sort of <coughs> hub of activity for um, both. There's Ooh, another one. That's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a public-private partnership too. So they're they're working closely Ooh, with oh. some of the, oh, the, the high tech another ocean one. science companies. It's so is that there. a brown china cups? I we presume. Gone in. Uh, that's all under the leadership well, of Dr. Larry. It is a uh, teen chocolate cops. Oh. The juveniles are black. Oh. And adults are pink. A teenager chocolate cops. That's cool. Hi, buddy. We just saw your mom or dad. Teenage. Maybe. Maybe aunt, mom's or uncle. Oh. oh. Bonk. Oh. Bonk. Hi, buddy. Okay, bye. Hope you find your dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nemo. Yeah, the co-director at SeaCom is uh, Andy Armstrong. He's actually been working tire tirelessly to make that happen as That's well fantastic. as Larry Mayer. That's a big investment. Uh, lots of uh, hope for that blue economy to generate uh, some additional work for the people up there and uh, really drive that field forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. So the the company Exhale that makes the Drix vehicle that we have out on Nautilus. Did uh, they change their name? They did, yeah. Huh. Um, so it used From to be the in unpronounceable X Blue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that company is now called Exhale. Um, they're based in France. Um, they actually have, are setting up like a manufacturing hub in Durham, New Hampshire. Wow. Oh. That's super cool. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and UNH so, and URI's new <laughs> research vessel will be arriving in sh shortly. Yeah, it's going to be super interesting yeah. to see how those end up getting applied and to what degree they rely on telepresence given the smaller size and, uh, you know, it can only carry two containers and they have to be side by side, so. Right. Yeah. Interesting challenges. Bridge nav. What's the name of that one? Do they name it yet? The RCRV? Yeah. The Narragansett Dawn. 270. Ah. Thank you. And then I think uh, the OSU one has a um, uh, First Nations uh, or uh, Indigenous uh, tribe uh, word is the name of that one. And I think University of Southern Mississippi is getting one named after an oceanographer, uh, I believe. And I think Jake, is that the replacement for Endeavor? The yes. Narragansett Dawn. Yep, it'll be. Well, that's cool. Um, and Hopeport uh, will be Narragansett Rhode Island. Yeah, they're doing a really good job on social media. If you follow the regional class research vessel. Uh, of posting updates about the builds and each as each one moves to a different phase of its build. So it, se it seems like we're now up on me. this um, this rise that Waypoint Seven's on. So uh, there might be some stuff here up on this pinnacle. Um, we're going to move kind of across it and then down, so there will be a little bit of a downslope, but not too much. Cap. Since those are part of the uh, UNOLS fleet owned by the Navy and operated by civilian mariners, I assume that they go through that same plating ceremony uh, tradition? You guys familiar with that? No. No? I'm not sure. Um, so when the hull is laid, and I could totally be getting this wrong, so as I say this, Dory, can you look it up and then correct everything I say? Yes. Uh, I think it's called a plating ceremony. Uh, I don't know. Good luck finding it. Um, as the hull is laid, they take a large piece of steel 
and the Navy personnel, usually an admiral, I think, in charge of the project, uh, chalks their initials or signature on there. And then uh, if it's named for a person, uh, a uh, relative of that person or someone close to them uh, does the same on the same sheet. And then a welder helps them weld their signature or initials onto that plate. And then it's uh, secured to the vessel. Uh, signifying that the construction of the hull is finished. And frequently, the um, non-Navy personnel who uh, signs the plate, I think, is also the person who christens the vessel when it first sets sail. Um, uh, on the uh, Neil Armstrong and the Sally Ride, those plates are down in the ginormous transducer hold on those vessels. On the Armstrong, I believe it's the sister of Neil Armstrong who signed it. And on the Sally Ride, it's uh, the partner of Sally Ride who signed it. And that's also the person who christened it. I didn't realize the UNOS vessels were owned by the Navy. Yeah, that's what the N stands for. Is that a Is megaphone it? sponge? Yes, it's a dual, like, dual megaphone wow. sponge. It's been so long. I think that was our very first yeah. dive, or maybe the second one. So, you know the University National Oceanographic wow. Laboratory System. Yeah. So, I know that, uh, I think the Agors are all owned by the Navy, as were the Nor and the Melville, but the Endeavor, Oceanus, and uh, I forget what the third one was called. They were not owned by the Navy. The, um, is the... Brown owned by the Navy? That's a NOAA That's ship. That's NOAA, isn't so it? I yeah. assume as that is another branch of the service that is owned by NOAA. Yeah, because that's an Agor 23 as well. And they're still using the Agor designation, right? I, yeah, I think they're like, uh, yeah. eight, they're not 23s, I forget what the number is. Yeah, the new ships, um, the Discoverer is being built right now um, as a next uh, NOAA Ocean Exploration primary mission to exploring the world's oceans. That's getting its keel laid, I believe, as we speak. Can I get a zoom on one of these little red guys here? Yeah, right under the lasers near us? Yeah, because it looks like they have white bases. I can't tell if they're just at the mass. Okay. happen to be sitting on white bases. Well, the one in the front actually is, so... Yeah, never mind. Sorry. You guys are good. Yeah, I mean, there's desperately a need for more resources for pushing research and exploration and science. So it's very hard for investigators to get ship time. Uh, so that's really where those regional class research vessels come in. So yeah, we're we're on the sort of high, we're getting to this high point here on the map for this yeah high point along the ridge. It feels like this high point's only several meters wide. It's pretty. Looks like it might be up to 150 meters, kind of lengthwise. So, Ed, it looks like the National Science Foundation, NSF, actually owns the vessels. Uh, the Yegors? The UNOS vessels. Yeah, right. that's what it is, the, the NSF. I think the Navy oversees their construction. Uh, cool. And then maybe they kind of, but they don't retain ownership. It's so strange that they're all, it seems like they always end up at different shipyards. I guess they're just spreading the work out or... It's all bid, yeah, it's yeah. all uh, competitive bidding. I am um, lucky enough to get on the ride and the Armstrong while they were being constructed. Yeah, I'd like to sail on those someday. It's so weird, it's, the modern ships uh, feel more like an office building than a vessel. <laughs> 
especially the ladders. Um, the stairwells? <laughs> yeah, they really are stairwells. You don't have to, you don't have to walk single file down them? Don't yeah. have stairs on a vessel. Well, on those they do. <laughs> and, uh, Call them what you will. <laughs> and, uh, don't they have elevators too? Yeah, they have elevators, but the, um, the ladder goes up half a deck and there's a landing and then it does a 180 and goes up another yeah. half a deck. It's like, it's like walking up a, like so a staircase. If staircase you, in a hotel. If you go up two decks trying to stay oriented is a challenge. Gone in I just can't doors. It's nice that two people can go different directions at once though. Yeah, we can't do yeah. that on all of us. The crew always uh, defers. I'm like, no, you can come up. They're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Especially when okay. they're carrying like yeah, they're like carrying like supplies. Yeah, they're levels. like, no, no, no. I think you've got ladder. a um, <laughs> coral sticking up. Yeah, through we got the a stray piece of coral on the great. porch. I don't is know. it sticking up th through the bottom or is it no, just it's there? stuck on the porch? Oh, okay. So I don't know if there's something we want to do about it oh. or if we want to. Uh, it's stuck under the camera. It looks like. Yeah, it looks like it got wedged. It's like some kind of bamboo got stuck. It's not coming up through that square? No. It's just kind of hanging out. It looks like Wind it was like a dead it. one that may have drifted on. Oh, yeah. Okay. A little push. Do you want to take it off? Yeah. I don't know. We, we, can, we can leave it on, but it was kind of floating up in the camera view. So. Yeah, may as well, let's take a moment and just take it off. Okay. Leave it, leave it in its environs. Full for what? Yeah, and the ship is stopped right now. That's good. Awesome. So this is like our... Mm, Thanks, Derek. Yep. How many dives have we done? 13? Uh, yeah, because this is 10. And we started with one plus the th three uh, yeah. Atlanta-only dives. That's That's pretty good. Um, I mean, we didn't have a single dive postponement for weather, which right. is kind of stunning. And I'm allowed to say that now without jinxing anything. Yep, we got <laughs> close last night. Yeah, we got close last night. So, Hannah, did you hear about the rock sample? No, what's uh, wrong with it? No. <laughs> it rocks. Why do you assume there's something wrong with it? I don't know. There's some. It's just made. It's just huge, <laughs> apparently. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I'm sure Val loves that. I don't think she knows about it yet. Oh. <laughs> they got on the last watch. Yeah, no, I've been I'm not sure how huge huge is, but it's um, it does not put the size on there, which is concerning. <laughs> it says rock subangular. Where'd they put it? They put it in starboard box E. Okay, well, if it can't be that big then. Starboard box E is one of the bigger ones. Yeah, but it still can't be that big. It's not like a tectonic plate. Older size. Yeah, so I've been wa I've been What's looking. What's going on with the sonar? Is? And I think this is all just low bait flow. Yeah. And then I was also trying to figure out how old the seamount was, um, and there's only two studies that okay. talked about it. What was in 1972? Huh. Wait. Yeah, I've seen you reading stuff. Yeah. Well, I started last night, and then. I got to this paper that was published in 1972, and it only had two paragraphs describing geology, and it was just saying like basically what we say on every um, every time we're on a dive, and I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, it's basalt, and they're like, yeah. this is basalt rocks with olivine, and <laughs> duh, and I was like, okay, so this is all things that like <laughs> we know and like, what to expect, all things that we could have assumed. Yes. And so then I went to the night, I'm reading, I was reading 1974 and there's only three possible ages from this, uh, this seamount volcano. And it's part of the Hawaiian hotspot chain, no not anybody. part cool. of the Cretaceous. Straight form. down, straight down, 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 down. Then again, or good resinged. Where? What? Bottom of frame. Very oh, bottom, 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 bottom. All right, bottom. Let's, let, let's play the game, guys. What do you guys think? That's a... Crinoid. Crinoid. Brzezinkid. 
an urchin. It was a crinoid. Crinoid. If I was going to say that, then I wanted to be different. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. but that, but I mean that's that's expeditions 50 years ago. Yep. So we might be able to find and something this is different. A, it's not even they didn't even use argon argon dating. Could they? Would they we have that they back then? They just did potassium argon and they didn't oh. have that back then. Yeah, I didn't think so. So um, yeah, we'll see what we find. Maybe we'll change things. Yeah. I just think it's crazy okay. how what it's just doing? going off of range. Yeah. I um, survey says Crinoid. Crinoid. There you go. I saw that one of the papers you're looking at was by Dalrymple. Yeah, and yeah I, Dalrymple. I, I cited one of the, is it he? Yeah. It yeah, I cited one of his papers um, on a project in the Gulf of Mexico. I just remember the name because it's such a unique name. Yeah, Dalrymple. That's actually a street on LSU's campus. <laughs> was it after him? I don't oh. know. Probably not. <laughs> but Dalrymple is also like one of my great great like grandpa's and oh, okay. my lineage of advisors because yeah his work on the Hess rise in the mid Pacific mountains was very that's cool useful and that right. was also in the those were published in the early 90s yeah I think that's when the paper on uh, the Mobile River was published it's super interesting the uh more senior generation of geologists when they went to college were told that the seamounts etc were the result of outflow from rivers etc and plate tectonics was not known really or taught to them i know certainly for dr ballard and i think dr mayer they had the same uh, thing and then that's uh, completely changed in their the lifespan of their career and you wonder like for a young professional like Hannah what changes or discoveries will completely alter the perception of geology and yeah, their career I was are we moving west again I was thinking when I s when or south, south Mike yeah. when you said K T boundary yeah and then now like since you've been it's like KPG I've never heard of that. And <laughs> KPG. I think that that was one of the, the that changes that. Do you mean it's like recent? I don't know when it was. I, it had to be recent enough. Do you know what that is? But it was P Cretaceous Tertiary, and then now it's Cretaceous Paleogene. So what? Tertiary doesn't exist anymore. It's interesting. Um, it's only in I the. I think it has a more yeah. distinct name now, oh, or okay. it's still there. But they just broke it down even more. Seems to come and go. Hannah and Sebastian, I have a question Heather, for y'all. I don't know. Um, we have a high school student who is wondering a, like, about how we ended up working for Nautilus, and I was wondering if you could give some advice about. Um, or just not even necessarily advice, just share your stories about how you kind of like got here or things that maybe helped you get to this point. And I know, Hannah, you've been talking or we've talked a lot before about like your journey to grad school, um, even from undergrad. Do you have anything that you'd be yeah. able to share with the student? So to where I got right now was completely did not ex like if you were to ask me a year ago, probably, I would have been like, there's no way that I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. And I think that's what's really exciting about being in grad school or yeah. just being, still being a student. It's like, you just don't know where mm -hmm. you're going to end up or where your path is going to take to take you. Um, and that's really exciting. Even though my parents don't find it exciting, they find it stressful because they're like, what are you doing? Like, what are you planning? And, um, like, what are you going to get? Like, a real job? <laughs> you know? And I'm like, ah, I love school, which is crazy. Um, but, yeah, so I'm just really thankful that when I read, so when I was reading about Dr. Balba, she had a project working on this, the mid-Pacific mountains and the Hess Rise, and I was like, that is super exciting. Would love to be a part of that. Messaged her, 
not message her, message her, then did a zoom with her, and Explore this basically area. when our right. cruise fell through, which was the one for the Mid-Pacific Mountains and the Hess Rise, she asked if I wanted to be a part of the Nautilus, and she was going to get in touch with Dr. Daniel Wagner, and it was her and Dr. Conrad that reached out to him. And then he reached out to me, and then that's that's how I went from there. But I feel like the Seamount community is super small because I'm pretty sure last dive, the geologist was Nick. And Nick is literally a master student of Dr. Conrad. So Dr. Balbus' husband. Mm -hmm. So a very, very, very small field. But I'm so excited that I got to be a part of this. Yeah. Can you share, because I know we've talked about this before, as an undergrad, as a freshman, how did you get involved with research? Yeah, so when I was a freshman, my intro teacher for geology, she put a list on the board of possible, not internships, but opportunities to be ha like to have with professors that are looking to take an undergrad so she made a list I looked up the people on the list and I picked off of what I found interesting so I really was interested in Dr. Suniti's work with Mars but at the time that was the first intro class that I've ever taken in geology like ever so I really didn't think I was well, I didn't have the tools or, like, the knowledge mm -hmm. to be a part of a undergrad, like, research because, mm -hmm. again, it was only my first semester. So I was actually too nervous to apply, to reach out to him right away because I didn't think I would bring anything to, like, to the table differently. It would just be m me relying on him to constantly, like, tell me things, and I I'd constantly be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> So I ha I worked up the courage at the end of my first semester and Go for zoom in. and after my first semester mm -hmm. during Christmas break I finally yeah, reached out to him and he was so nice and I told him my concerns of you know not being able to contribute a lot based off of my knowledge that I had of geology so far so Every week he would have a meeting to give Those some anonymous. more background about the research he was doing. And it was really nice because he he really took my concern yes, like and he made Sorry. me feel more confident about what I was doing. So, nice. yeah, that's, that's my story with undergrad research. And then I just kept going on from there because mm -hmm. ga he gave me the confidence I needed to reach out to those professors. Awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. Thanks. Thanks for asking. I'm sure Sebastian has probably a different yeah. story because Sebastian is like incredible and has like multiple labs that he works just for. Just to interrupt for a second, back row, we have, uh, we're just kind of struggled on our last ship move. So we were just kind of waiting out for a, a minute. Yeah. So I just put a new one in, just a small step at 25 meters, Let's bearing 190. And we'll see if it can do it. I think you're muted, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Sounds good. Sure thing. Okay, do you want me to tell my part of the story now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it can um, be as much as you are willing to share yeah. right now about just kind of your path to getting here. Um, so I was incredibly fortunate enough to join the Nautilus in 2013 as a high school student um, through a program called the Honors Research Program, which unfortunately is no longer a uh, functioning program here at OET. Um, but it was an incredible program where I got to go to University of Rhode Island and learn the basic principles of ocean exploration and at University of Rhode Island and their Inner Space Center. 
before being sent out on the Nautilus for a short cruise, in my case to the mid Cayman Rise, to look at hydrothermal vent fields. Um, prior to that, um, as a high school student, what I did to kind of get ready for to get into opportunities like that was the to. Moving or if that's the oh. termination, then it's. That is the termination. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't want to interrupt uh, let me them. take a look here. Hold on. Uh, yeah, this is a recovery line rigged on it. On uh, Atalanta, it's just a little loose as it's. Well, the BSR is straight up. A lot more likely the camera's loose. Are you? Termination. You talking about the BSR or the camera? I mean, um, I took a hit last night on deployment. Just like. It took a hit. You say it took a hit during uh, launch? Oh, yeah, it was under a lot of strain. You want me to get Dan? Well, you still have. Recovery line, uh, you know, between the two. Right. Yeah, but we're talking about the tether. You've oh. got dead vehicle. You have one dead vehicle. Is now out of sight. So we're saying the BSR is damaged. That's what. That yeah. Was. I'll go. Uh, can can yeah, can you? I think, can I, think I have Megan stand by. So would you zoom in on the? Uh, Adelante camera down onto her. Yeah, just give me a second. So yeah, we're just looking at the tether coming off her. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me uh, try over here. Uh, pump it up here. I'm gonna try and come in with uh, Adelante. You ready? Bridge now. Just gonna come down a hair. Yeah. Give me a second. Working on your focus. We can do all stop. Thank you. Come a little more. But it sure looks like it's pointed straight up. Yeah. Are there any uh, lights we can turn on on the back of her? There's just the one. Right? Uh, you can turn your lights off. Might actually help, Tito. All right. Turning lights off. And then I'm going to iris up. That's as iris up as I can go. Give me just a sec to bounce. Can you, uh, what's your altitude? Uh, we've got a pretty good delta. But no, I meant uh, for Herc. If Herc was closer to the bottom. Ten meters. It's, uh, nine meters off right now. Yeah, if you come down, your lights will bounce up and illuminate that a little bit more. Coming down with you. Uh, he'd like you to go down to the bottom as he thinks the lights will bounce off the yep. bottom and yeah, uh, reflect a bit on two. You come down to like point, point 0.6. And I'll come in again and see if it helps at all. Uh, and I can. And how far down are we tilted? Uh, why don't I see those cameras? Okay, yeah. Give me a moment. I'm going to tilt down more. Yeah. Where's and I'm going to bring the heading over a little. Oh, I know why. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, that ran off on me. Yeah, you're okay. Coming in. And we're just going to have to catch it on a bounce. It, it does look a skew. Bringing the tilt up a bit. That looks like it's gone straight up. 
Yeah, it does. Uh, hold on just a sec. And I'm going to turn some lights on on a lot to see if we can... Uh... Yeah, let me just get a shot of this real quick. I can pull it from the video, but uh, uh, get that real quick. Thank you. And let me see where we are in our files. Um, go put you on auto iris, sorry. Oh, not auto, manual. And I'm going to throw some lights on, you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The, uh, and then... Uh, okay, what there is it? Fifteen nineteen. Do yeah. two Spicy plus launch. fifteen at seventeen. Sporty. Uh, yeah, they hung out for a long time before they committed. Yeah. Um, so down here, I want the H two six four. Now that shows it just as well. down, see if that helps at all. I think my focus is good. Uh, I want the other camera. Fifteen and nine, so I gotta wait like three minutes to have that file available. Yeah, I don't even see it, and I don't see it at all in the butt camera. I've never seen that. That was my first thought, too. I'm hopping off SPL. So I would say that during the Z, we would try to keep a bit of a delta, no tension. So you know, we'd keep an eye on it with the sonar. So have a 25 meter delta between the two. Maybe not put any way on the uh, vehicle, or excuse me, on the ship during the ascent. And well, let's see what Dan says, but that certainly looks as if it is pointing uh, at 70 degrees straight up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any other choice here. Yeah, that's good. Which is where we are now. But that is that directly west? Or east, I mean? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Derek, just uh, in case we do lose power, uh, the first thing you want to do is get a half a knot of forward way on the ship so that we're streaming the vehicle. At that point, we're not concerned with uh, the tether. Uh, we've got the recovery line between the two vehicles. 
but we want to make sure that we're streaming and that we have everything kind of safely. So power goes out, just call and that move to the bridge, half a knot along the heading. Not necessarily. What we might have them do is change the heading of the vessel okay. during the recovery. But uh, once again, having some forward way on is the most important thing so the vehicle can't drift towards us. But I think the crane uh, can swing out to the port side of the vessel, you know, by swinging right. You know, they're going to start hauling in, and what we do with Jason is just kind of swing outboard. And I do believe that they can also extend the crane a little bit more if they want you know, the, the boom extension. the tape. Yeah, the, the two wraps of electrical tape on two or three spots. That's the only place you could, right? I mean, at the bolts, yeah. the bolts had to have come free. That took some juice. Hey guys, I'm going to go update either Megan or Daniel or whoever's up. Yeah, copy. I'm not sure. Uh, I didn't see either of them down there. Just as an update for our viewers, um, we appreciate y'all being patient. Um, we're working through um, an issue right now and trying to make a decision about how to move forward with this dive. So we'll come on in a little bit and explain what's going on.
full zoom. Yeah, zoom out, Ed, please. Yep. All the way? Yeah. All the Just want to give everyone on uh, watching on Nautilus Live a quick update. Uh, we're just checking out something with the tether between the two vehicles um, and assessing um, what the next step is. So just stand by and we appreciate your patience. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yeah, I saw what I needed to see. Thank you. Coming out. Full light. Hey folks, coming home. Are you coming up? Yeah, we're coming up. Start at 20, see how that goes.
Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, just quickly, uh, Dan and I just discussed uh, whether or not we'd move the ship or move the vehicle. We're going to do the ship at point three ahead, and we're not going to put any forward way on. That's in case we lose power. We don't have to get the ship moving. We don't have to change anything if we were to lose power. Point three ahead on the ship. We are, but so the only thing that uh, seems damaged on the tether is the strain relief. So the tether isn't compromised. All the strength is on the other side is that plate, right? The plate. So what we had discussed was two different options. We could either put some forward way on the vehicle or we could put forward way on the ship to keep the, the vehicle streaming aft. And it's safer to have the ship moving in case we lose power, we wouldn't have to change anything. So we're going to do point 0.3 ahead on the ship. And if we were to lose power, we would increase that to point 0.5 as we would lose uh, visibility. Along the heading of the ship. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, Roger that. Yeah, we were just talking about that. Thanks. Just right now, I think we have auto heading on uh, Herc. No, no so we're just literally right now. He's driving ahead very with. Uh, you can see the percentage of thrust on the thrusters. That's top left blue box with the red. So you can see his horizontals are working at 46 percent, and his horizontals are working at 20. So he's driving away from Atalanta right now. Um, and that's just to keep us streaming nicely. If we were to lose power, we'd lose that much of the, the differential between the two. So that's 0.3, and then that's probably good for 0.2 or 0.3. But it's just nice to get control of the situation. If we were to lose power, we'd guarantee that uh, Herc is going to stay aft of the vessel at half a, half a knot. Whereas 0.3, get some currents on the surface, and actually, you know, when we get up to 500 meters, let's take another look at the ADCP data, and we may have to increase speed if we were to lose power, but as we still have control right now. Gives us control of the situation. about 96 minutes.
what do you call that again? The strain relief? You have a different name for it. B BSR from strain relief. That's what I think it's like for it. I can't I can't say what we call it. Here. It looks like we had a pretty good yank at early on in the dive, yeah. very early in the dive. That is for what? That's uh, at 313. Uh, Atalanta itself couldn't have created that number. It would have been had to pull on something else too. story. That's when Robert did his road trip. No. Just as an update for our viewers that are watching with us, um, after noticing an issue with the tethers that connect ROV Hercules and Atalanta, we are recovering both vehicles and we'll continue to assess the issue once they are back on deck. I think it's going to take us about an hour and a half to get back to the surface. And just so y'all are aware, I'm about to hop off uh, comms for a ship to shore interaction in a few minutes here. Thanks, Tori.
was hard to tell until yeah. he went down a little further and just went right out of sight. I might have, I might have kissed it a few times. Obviously. More than a few times. It was hard to tell. 